Wow, it's really dark. So first off, um, sorry about the lighting. Um, we did set up down the bottom of the boat uh, where the lighting was really good, um, but we started to melt. Um, so yeah, <laughs> we decided to, to come on into the inside of the boat. Are you going to say the right? Oh, that's, oh, cool. oh, that's, oh, that's way good. good. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's me. When I move, it gets, changes the light. You're changing the light? I could see the Northwest Passage plan. <laughs> no, no. You notice that? <laughs> That's our navigation system. Yeah. Wife says you have a nice dress on, Jess. Oh, thanks. <laughs> right, I'll, oh, I'll give you that. So, so thanks for joining us, guys. Um, I suppose what we wanted to do is give you an update as to where we're at. It's been a couple of months since we've done a live feed. Um, and we also wanted to... Um, <laughs> we mostly wanted to... Uh, talk about the veggie oil conversion because that's sort of like what's forefront in our in our work plan at the moment. Um, but this isn't ask us anything. So if there's anything that you want to know, don't don't you know have to you don't have to stick to the veggie oil topic. Just just ask us anything you like. We're really happy to sort of go down those paths. Um, so I suppose um, a quick like an update as to where we've where we've uh, been in the last couple of months. Um, Previous to the veggie oil stuff, we've been working on a lot of uh, like painting and getting sort of interior stuff sorted for the boat. Um, that's kind of, it's not finished, definitely not finished, but in a way it's sort of done for a bit. We're, we're sort of holding off on that for now. Um, and we're focusing on getting... Um... <laughs> it's going to steal the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all about, it's the miss show today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the dog show. He has been in a really cute mood for the last two days. Yeah. <laughs> We need to uh, deal with our fuel tanks. So we have to basically blast out our fuel tanks and clean them up. Um, we also need to do the, the oil heating systems. Um, so that's um, uh, a lot of the modifications and so on for the engine are based around that oil heating system. And then we also need to put is the entire veggie tank insulated and heated or just the day tank? Oh, that's a cool question, Mike. Um, hang on, I'm not gonna read them for now. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, so so basically, the tanks are part one. Um, the uh, the in, uh, sorry, the cooking of the veggie oil, so actually creating the fuel is, is part two that we want to show you. And then part three is what modifications are needed for the engine, and then hopefully starting the engine on veggie oil. So um, there's there's about eight se eight episodes in this whole veggie oil conversion that we're doing. Um, it's because it's quite detailed, so um, we want to sort of yeah give you as much information as possible. So. There's a lot of myths around converting and running a, a diesel on um, on veggie oil, and part of what we want to do with this is kind of show you the ins and outs. Like, there's a lot of vehicles that run on this, and there's also a lot of people that have tried it and had problems. So, we kind of want to show you like the whole nuts and bolts. You know, what worked, what didn't, um, because we've never done this before. Just to clarify, we, we we've never done this before. This is the first engine that we've converted to run on deep on veggie oil. But you know diesel engines pretty well. Yeah, and saying that, I'm an ex-diesel engineer, so I know diesels through and through. Um, we can, at any stage, run the motor back on diesel, so it's a dual fuel system. Um, so, you know, if it doesn't work on visual, we just run it on diesel and it's, it's fine. Um, the flip side is there's tens of thousands of these vehicles or conversions running around the world that are running on visual. So it is possible. Um, as I say, we haven't done it before, so we're just sort of learning how to do it, and and that's going to be this series of basically showing you, you know, our, our process, I suppose, of, of going through that to figure it out. So um, yeah, I'll we'll get into some questions. Tony, <laughs> Tony, stop. You make working with steel seem like playing with plasticine. <laughs> Highly educational. <laughs> Tony, when I first started four years ago, I made um, working with steel seem like I was I was a dinosaur in a china shop. <laughs> Mike, okay, cool. I'll ask you, Mike Love, is your entire veggie tank insulated and heated or just a day tank? So Brewpeg has, currently has uh, four fuel tanks. And when we go um, on really long journeys, that's gonna be up, that's gonna be bumped up to eight. Um, so we'll convert our, currently we've got six, two of them are water, four of them are fuel. When we go really long distance, we're going to add another two tanks into the boat and convert all of them to fuel and put a water maker on. So what's the, the maximum? It's 20, 23... Uh, 23,500 yeah. litres is what we're going to have it's in the goal. tanks. It's the goal. Um, and, and if we need it, we'll put two bladders down the deck, so sausage bladders that hold two tonne of, of uh, oil each, so another another 4,000 litres of fuel. Um, well, it's actually slightly more than 4,000 because it's 1,150 kb a tonne anyway. But the tanks aren't actually insulated, are they? No. So none of the tanks are insulated. So, so sorry, yeah, to answer Mike's question, are the tanks insulated or just a day tank? None of the tanks are insulated. 
Um, and the reason we haven't gone down the road of insulating them is it's, it's just too hard. You know, like there's the tanks are part of the hull, so the tanks are actually built into the hull, and which means that they're in thermal contact with the water. So whatever the seawater temperature is, is whatever the fuel temperature is. Um, and for us, in order for us to be able to insulate it, um, it, it just becomes really, really difficult because we have to allow diesel to be put in those tanks. And I, and I just don't know of any insulation that I could use that would work well enough that wouldn't just get destroyed with diesel um, because it's dual fuel. We need to be able to have the tank for diesel or oil. So if we put diesel in it, most, most um, uh, insulations and most substrates just start to fall apart. Um, but the other thing is that we're, we're thinking probably we're going to be using diesel in the polar regions. I just because trying to keep the veggie oil uh, liquid because yeah. it'll just it'll just go really grungy. It'll, it'll, it'll congeal, yeah. Congeal. So I mean, diesel can, can yeah. alter in those sort of temperatures too. So, so when you when you get in, just to give some context, when you get into the and, and you know people from Canada and stuff will know this, when you get into the really cold sort of weather and the climate and stuff like that, um, LPG doesn't work like it normally works, or natural gas doesn't work, you know, like it normally works. Um, diesel can start to congeal, so you have to have a very specific type of diesel, cold weather diesel. It normally has a much higher sulfur content um, and veggie oil starts to basically congeal and go solid much sooner than, than diesel does. So um, Brewpeg has the capability of running on veggie oil 100%, um, but it's not to say that we'll be using it 100% of the time because we just, the physical limitations of it mean in some cases we won't, so we'll have to use diesel. So, um, so hopefully that answers your question, Mike. Um, but as for heating the oil, the oil absolutely has to be heated in order to use. So that's part of our fuel line system. The actual fuel lines themselves are heated. Um, there's heat exchangers, the fuel filters are heated, um, but the tanks themselves, two out of the six tanks will be will have heating coils in them. Um, and the other four are basically just holding tanks that will just pump through, you know, slow, sludgy, cold oil to get to the, the two tanks at the back, which will then be heated, which will raise the temperature enough to flow easily through fuel pipes. And then they'll go through heated fuel pipes, heated filters, um, heat exchanges on the engine and so on. So by the time it gets to the engine, it's actually really warm. It sounds really complicated, but it's not really. Yeah, so so that'll all be detailed in our, um, uh, it'll all be detailed in our fuel episodes. So um, yeah, stay tuned for that one. Um, Frantic Sailing, our buddy Reese. How are the crew checking in here reporting for duty? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since you showed up on the boat, Reese. <laughs> I haven't heard from you in about two hours. Yeah. <laughs> Fill or kill? So, are you comfortable living on the boat? Creature comforts as you are sitting on the dry. I'll let Jess answer that. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. It's uh, been oh, I don't know, eight months, I think, since it's been comfortable. Yeah. Before that, right at the beginning, like two years ago, we were camping in tents out the back of the boat, and there were bugs. And you know, summers here are really, really difficult. And yeah, running water um, didn't happen for the first year. <laughs> so, yeah. Actually, Dan got told off by a guy who came <laughs> um, out on a boat. Um, Greg, a Kiwi, he said, you've got to get some running water in there. So um, yeah, he did. So no, it's actually quite good. We've got like a, a washing machine, dishwasher, comfortable beds. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's really good. We've got power <laughs> to what we need now, sofas and it's good. Yeah, much easier now, but it's all been worth it, you know, just uh, he's laughing. What are you laughing at? Jackson Sable. <laughs> he's, got the, he's got the best sense of humor, man. He's awesome. Um, all right. So, uh, Madison Digama, she's said, I keep forgetting how to say that. Digimur, Digimur, not Digimur, Digimur. Yeah, there we go. Um, all right, so uh, Doug at SVC Cat and also um, Digimur, right, so is oil readily available at most ports and where are we going to get the video from? So, most, and this is a bit of a generalization, but most large centers, like say over 100,000 population, will have a pretty robust oil collection service. So if you've got like, you know, McDonald's and KFCs and chicken and chicken shops and, you know, anything that kind of deep fries stuff, um, they they generally go like a small, just to, to give you some context, a small fish and chip shop will go through about between 40 and 80 litres of oil a week. Um, so if you've got half a dozen basic mum and dad fish and chip shops, you've got more than enough to fuel the average boat. Um, for us, we need a lot more fuel than that. So we'll be buying, you know, five to 10 tonne of fuel at a time. Um, but in saying that, uh, to, to, to give you some ideas, uh, in the major centre that's closest to us, Brisbane, there's four oil collection companies, and the smallest collects 80,000 litres a month. 
So it gives you some idea as to, and Brisbane's got, I think, about what, 1.5 million people. Yeah. So it gives you some context there. So anywhere that there's a million people or more, you're going to have a, a vast supply of, of veggie oil that's available. Normally, veggie oil is used um, not for fuel. It, it, it can be used for biofuel, um, but it's like converted into biodiesel. Um, but it's normally used for um, animal feedstock. So for every litre of oil that we buy and use in our motor, um, we're preventing basically, a, a, I suppose, a litre of um, uh, yeah, fat being used in the animal feedstock industry, if, if you will. Mm. But we can actually get it um, shipped. Yeah, so... So so if we get yeah. stuck, so say, say we're travelling around the world and we go into a centre and there's just not enough to supply us because we're doing a big... A big expedition or something we can actually get it shipped yeah. in and then we it comes in uh what are they called the com so, containers you yeah know? so you, you can buy it on the global market IBCs? you can buy it on the global market and there's a couple of ways that you can buy it you can either buy it in 20 litre drums um by what's called ibc's intermediate bulk carriers which are like a big square cube they're about a thousand liters yeah um or you can buy it in bladder 2000 litre bladders and they they come in a 20 foot shipping container it's the four the size of the bladder is the footprint of a 20 foot shipping container um, and they're about maybe, I don't know, half a foot or a foot high, um, and they hold 2,000 litres, and they'll stack three or four of them up on top of each other in a, in a shipping container, and they can send it anywhere in the world. So um, we can forward ship our fuel. So depending on where we're going, and, and that's the other thing, is because Brewpeg can hold so much fuel capacity, we can also time when we're going to buy the fuel, so we can buy it, because it, it does vary quite a lot. And like, it's like, right, right now, it's like amazingly cheap. Yeah, amazingly cheap. Like, yeah. it's to give, you, to give you some context, you can buy veggie oil, um, for 100 to 150 le 100 to 150 US per ton, so we need we need 16 ton right now, and we're going to need 27 ton when we're like got all of our tanks sorted. But if we were to fill up with diesel, we're looking at about 45 thousand dollars to fill up. But if we were to fill up with veggie oil, we'd probably have change from five grand. So it's it's uh, economically it's a huge reason to to look at doing it. It's like that comment is <laughs> it's very good. It's great. <laughs> Some boats have a sense of the stomach. I think I speak for everyone who might going to ask this. Are you going to use organic gluten-free veggie oil? <laughs> Free range, yeah, definitely, all of that. Um, Mike Love, uh, will you use hot water from the engine in pre-warming the veggie oil? Yes. So the fuel lines, the fuel filters, and the, um, the oil heat exchanger are all powered by um, waste heat from the engine cooling system. And any leftover heat that we have is actually going to be pumped into the interior of the boat um, into radiators and things like that so that we can actually warm the inside of the boat with essentially just waste heat from the engine. Uh, and then whatever's left, if, we, if we've got everything we need and we've still got to get rid of some heat, we'll be putting that into the keel cooling system to cool the engine down. And of course, all of these systems, getting them in place and everything, is going to take time. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a gradual process right now, just getting in the water and getting floating is the main goal. Um, ruthless Ronnie, how did the old diesel you removed from Brewpeg clean cleanup? We, we haven't done it yet, mate. Um, <laughs> We just thought we'd ferment it in the sun a bit longer. <laughs> we want to see how yeah. nice coloured it can we really need, go. We need to do a follow up on that. Yeah, we, yeah. we will. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping to actually do that as part of the creating veggie oil fuel series. So we'll do probably two videos on actually making fuel out of vegetable oil, and then I'll probably because I'll have all the system built at that stage, I'll then do a, an episode on how to actually fix dead diesel. And you're, you're thinking of you're going to use this company that can do like analyse it and everything, yeah, and help you sort of sort out oxidation and everything else. So yeah, because I want it's kind of it's taking time to kind of get that organised. That's why we haven't yeah. really, and we've been so busy. Because I, I want to do it properly. Like I don't want to filter it and go, oh yeah, that looks good enough, and throw it on my diesel engine yeah, and destroy right. it. So I, I'd rather filter it and give it to a company that can give me, you know, test it and give me numbers and actually say it's good or it's bad or it's medium or you know whatever it is. So that because then it starts to remove some subjectivity from it. Like I'd rather people like if it works awesome if it doesn't work we've lost nothing but i'd rather know for sure but it's also really interesting right? yeah i'm really curious as to see whether it's actually usable because it's been for a while yeah 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 that'd be cool mm. yeah what about the route planning we see the map tell us about it all right fair enough mm. do you want to do that one well yeah with with we're kind of getting clearer and clearer yeah, yeah you want to talk about the map and we'll yeah because yeah, we'll, yeah. this lighting is probably not the greatest thing do you want to sort out a camera and we'll, we'll go on the run got it are we moving that now? Oh, I see you're going to the map. Yeah. All right, cool. We were thinking that we would um, cross the Pacific and go via Chile to Antarctica, which is like the major goal. Um, one of the major goals, the first major goal. Um, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to go from where we are up to the, the Great Barrier Reef 
Then we're going to go down the coast and we're going to look at Tasmania for a bit. Then we're going to, it looks like we're going to cross to New Zealand. We're going to come in at Bluff, which is right down the bottom of New Zealand, amazing area. Um, and we're going to uh, investigate around there. There's some um, sounds and fjords, amazing down there. So we're going to do that. And we're actually thinking we're going to leave from Antarctica from New Zealand rather than Chile over here. So that means we don't have to cross the Pacific to get to Antarctica first. The only issue is it's a harder trip. It's it's You've got side-on um, weather the whole way down, and it's uh, quite a bit longer. Um, that's why we were trying to avoid it. But we actually think it would be really cool to do that. Um, and, sorry, and jump in. Yeah. There's also like a string of islands down the bottom mm. end of New Zealand that we can start to hide from weather. So I, I used to work down here on big trawlers and stuff, and... Um, the weather in the Southern Ocean is can be really placid most of the time, and then it'll just absolutely go mental, and you have to essentially hide behind like 80, 80 to one hundred knots, and for like ten to fifteen meter seas is pretty like it's quite common down there. Um, so when that sort of stuff happens, I don't want to have brew pig out in the open. I'd rather be like stuck behind an island just waiting for it to blow itself out because it normally only blows itself out in a day or two. Like it's it moves quite fast down there, and then once that's happened, then we'll carry on. So we can pick our weather windows. In that part of the world easier um, than if we were to go from say Australia for argument's sake. Mm. And then the, the idea is okay so we'll spend quite a bit of time hopefully the whole season it's uh, November through to March then in Antarctica where the, you can actually get into the land mass. Um, so we'll, we'll spend as much time as we can and we'll, we'll go round Antarctica over to the um, what's this called? Uh, Antarctic Peninsula. Yeah Antarctic Peninsula and um, we'll go from there um, either straight out or we'll go yeah, south georgia Falkland. yeah so we'll head back over and we'll come back out over here but we may spend quite a bit of time in new zealand um yeah. before we deal with that and it, it, it's it's such a huge trip it's going to take a lot of pets and from there we're thinking we'll go up um up north and we'll head north and the goal really is to get through the northwest passage at some point and possibly um head towards russia but all of that sort of we're not sure yet um, yeah. If you have any ideas as to where you'd like to go, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone's here, you just open up, you just open up the can of worms. <laughs> yeah, because right now that's 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 it. That's it. Now here's that's uh, Brittany's going to do that. Yeah. Um, but after that, so sort, of, sort of from it, here it's up, all open yeah, and, from here up, we're a bit flexible. Mm. We're pretty keen to do this and, and a bit of Greenland, but we like everywhere else is. Um, yeah, I, I suppose we're a bit. Yeah, we're pretty open to ideas and, and able to be influenced. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's Brad Harris from New Zealand. Hey, brother! <laughs> that, actually, that actually is Jess's brother. It is, yeah. <laughs> Brad's been over quite a few times. He's done so yeah. much work on this boat for us, and yeah, he's a huge part of it. Hi, Judy. <laughs> uh, Seeker, Doug, so you're going to set up. So, are you going to set up to be able to process on board? What's that set up like? Yeah, that's, so I'll now go down. Yeah, we're on, yeah, we're on yeah, the move. Yeah. Show. All right, cool. I'll show you that now. <laughs> that's going to stay with us. All right, let's go. This is what it's like. This is uh, life on brew pig. Is <laughs> walking around with cameras everywhere. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll show you our veggie oil processing. So you got a thousand liter um, drum of fuel, and that's uh, a real easy way to ship things around the world. So when we first collect that oil, it comes in these. Um, these little 20 litre drums you can see, so I've got dozens and dozens and dozens all stacked up over the back there. Jess is off-road wheelchair in the foreground. Um, so we chuck it, at this point we chuck it into these big um, thousand litre drums um, and that helps us to settle the oil, so any like any bits of chips or um, fish or anything like that, it basically sinks down to the bottom. And then we have a real basic pumping set up here at the moment. So it's just a, a 30 micron filter just to protect the pump. We've got a, a fuel pump here. Uh, just a rotary fuel pump and then a, a five micron filter um, once the oil I, once it's full i chuck a bit of um, biocide in there just to kill off any bacteria and things like that there's normally nothing but just in case um, and i leave it to sit for about a month and it sort of settles everything right down and then i pump the top 90 percent down so i leave about 100 liters in the bottom it then gets pumped over into this tank over there so that's clean what i call clean oil waiting to be processed so it's sitting there at about five micron um, and there's no real rubbish in it. It's pretty clear. It's good, um, good oil. Here we go along here. You can see I've got these big water tanks, so so electric water heaters and so on. Um, so this this is a th uh, 300 liter um, hot water cylinder. 
and this is going to become the basis of our um, veggie oil cooker. So um, the way the, the process works um, is you, there's, there's a book that I'm going to, when we release the highlights of this live feed on Tuesday, I'm going to have a link to the book and everything, but there's this awesome book that we've been working with the guy that um, helped create it. There's about 10 years worth of research that's gone into it, and um, there's a few different versions of, of cookers, but his seems to be one of the most sort of well thought out. Um, basically what you need to do, it, like in a, this is a very simplistic way, but you need to heat the oil to above about 80 degrees um, and hold it there for two hours, 80 degrees Celsius and hold it there for two hours. And then you let it cool down overnight and the water and oil separate and you drain off the water from the bottom. So you have to modify the tank and everything so that you can put um, drain fittings at the bottom. Um, then, uh, then the second day you basically heat it back up to get it up to, uh, you know, fluid high, high temp, so 80 degrees or more. Um, and then you need to filter it through. Um, so if it takes, let's say for argument's sake, it takes you 10 minutes to uh, completely drain the tank from top to bottom with your pump. You need to pump it for 70 minutes through a filter. So you keep circling it through a filter. So it has to go through at least seven times. Um, and at that stage, you'll be taking it down to one micron, um, which should be pretty easy because the fuel won't have anything bigger than five micron in it. So the, the filters will last a wee bit of time. And at that point, it's ready to pump into our tanks. So, you can see our tank over the back here. We still haven't had it blasted yet. We're still waiting on the blasting and everything to happen. Um, so that's it's been delayed quite a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna, th the next stage is basically blasting this tank out and painting it and then pumping all of the fuel, uh, all of the processed oil into that tank. I'm just gonna show you this. This little bird stalks me around when I work. <laughs> this guy here. <laughs> all right, so. Yeah, okay, so the, the reason Ryan just wants to show everyone inside the tank. So, so this is, gosh, that lighting's horrific. Hang on. Oh, there you go. So it's it's basically just um, rusty steel. Um, this has never been painted. This is forty years old, um, and that's for a diesel tank. That's completely fine. That's how these trawlers just do them all the time commercially. For us, we need to paint it, and the reason being is because the mild steel interacts with the veggie oil and it oxidizes it. If the oil gets oxidized, there's nothing you can do to resolve it. And the fuel is no longer usable as a fuel. It, it just it ruins ruins your injectors. It ruins fuel filters. It turns into just a, you know tons of sludge basically. So um, yeah, we have to be really careful to prevent that. And one of the things we're doing, plastic is perfect, but metal is not that great. Um, so we paint the tanks, and that obviously removes the metal contact. All of the fuel lines and everything in Brewpeg are stainless. So what we're actually planning, um, the thought that I had was uh, pushing um, plastic fuel lines down the existing stainless fuel line. So it's gonna reduce the diameter a bit, but these front tanks are just storage tanks anyway. So it just means with a reduced diameter, it just means that it's gonna take us longer to pump the, the fuel from the front to the back. So I think we can probably manage that. So in our upcoming episodes, we're gonna be documenting the whole process of, um, you know, from collection right through to burning the oil in a diesel engine. And we'll sort of show you basically every step of how we actually do that. Um, so. I'll just climb back upstairs and set up again. And we had a question about hot pies before. Yeah, that's uh, Jackson. Here. <laughs> uh, yeah. Jackson. I have another very important question <laughs> about hot pies. To give everyone some context, Jackson asked me earlier, "Is there any stupid questions?" And I said, "Absolutely," <laughs> <laughs> and gave him a list of stupid questions. And I think he's trying to add to that list. Um, so we have another important question. How many Irvine's pies can you fit into your microwave on the boat or do you heat it up in the oven like a savage? <laughs> yes, like a savage. Yeah, we don't have a Definitely. microwave. <laughs> straight out straight out of the freezer. Yeah. Cold, <laughs> cold in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> meat flavoured ice block. Um, so, uh, almost means not. Sounds pretty neat. Have you offset the fuel costs of having the fuel shipped to you? It's pretty it's actually pretty cheap to ship a twenty foot shipping container around the world. Um, and given that we save nearly forty thousand dollars per full load of fuel, shipping might be maybe fifteen hundred bucks. Two grand, even if it's five grand, it's still incredibly cheap. So. With the price how it is right now, you told me the other day what it would take to fill the tanks. What was the amount? It's less than five grand. Five it's grand like for, how, three for how many litres? I think it was like three and a half thousand dollars. For oh, from memory, it was like three and a half thousand dollars to fill the boat from completely nothing. That's, that's total. And that gives us eight and a half thousand nautical miles of range. Yeah, so right now it's yep. really, really cheap. Cheaper than it normally is. I think that makes sense. <laughs> when are you taking Brewpeg to Tulsa? I've got to say I'm so ignorant. I know Tulsa's in America, and I know it's in the middle. That's the limit of my knowledge. <laughs> um, greetings from South Carolina, USA. Thanks for sharing your journey with us. Thanks very much, Stan. Uh, 
frantic is this is there is something wrong with your map <laughs> <laughs> island's supposed to be in the middle what are you you will be nowhere near Ireland by the time we go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. We're talking about, we're talking to yeah. race these um Frantic sailing frantic beaches. Sailing yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's he's building well refitting a, a, a lovely big steel boat, um, pretty much single handedly amazing. Um so yeah, these these guys you know, catch up. Andy, train trainscape, you guys should head down to South Australia and our, our Spencer Golf is a hidden gem with twenty plus islands. Oh. Well worth oh, a look, Andy. Cool. Yeah, we'll check that we'll out, eh? Hey. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I see the Northwest Passage. Good. <laughs> I want two berths for the Northwest. Just give me warning for timing. <laughs> Sweet as. Did you uh, send us an email? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Great Lakes US. Awesome. Um, come, all to, right. over come to, to Switzerland. Switzerland. Yeah, we right actually. We're, yeah, we'd like to. It's... Actually, that's part of the thing is when we start going around and adventuring and all that sort of stuff, we're not just going to confine ourselves to Brutbeg. So. If we're in a spot that's, you know, there's some amazing stuff inland or whatever, we will probably just, you know, grab a car and actually go and see that place. We don't want to just stick to the coast. The, oh, endless, the endless river. Aren't you worried about going through the Northwest Passage with the system? Where will you get your oil over there? So um, in the really cold areas, so this is to answer the endless river question. So in the really cold areas, it's, it's quite possible that the veggie oil will congeal and it won't be usable. So in some areas we will be using straight um, cold weather diesel to go through parts of the world, but we can get there using oil. So mm. you know if we can offset eighty percent of our costs by using oil to get there, then then great. And because it's a dual fuel boat, we'll be able to just use, switch over to diesel and, and you know drive through the passage in diesel and then go straight back to oil when we get into a warmer climate. Um, that said, we're gonna we're gonna test how far we can get with oil, like how what sort of temps we can get with oil and so on. So. Um, I don't, I don't know what we can get away with, but we'll, we'll keep doing some testing and so on until we know that for sure. Um, as for, are you worried about going through the Northwest Passage with the system? Not really. I'm worried about not getting there. <laughs> mm. Can any diesel? Oh, cool. Can, Gary Barris, can any diesel engine run on oil, or what determines what can mm. and what can't? Mm. Uh, it's pretty simple. So. It, can any diesel run on veggie oil? Yes. If, it, if it's converted, right? It has to be for a conversion. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, if I'll, it's a computer. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'll answer the question, eh? Yeah. Good work. Okay. Um, <laughs> high five. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, yeah. So, yes. Just answer. Just, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll have a cup of tea when you carry on. <laughs> so, so can, any, can any diesel run on veggie oil? Yes, it can. Um, the fuel has to be processed. So, so you've got two main types of diesels. You've got mechanical injection and electronic injection. Mechanical injection is, is probably the most common. It's really kind of basic and every diesel for the last hundred years has pretty much been mechanical injection. Electronic injection is a relatively new thing and it's probably only, I don't know, the last 10 or 15 years it's really come into its own. Um, and it's computer controlled injection and it's mainly for timing and fuel efficiency, uh, uh, emissions and fuel efficiency is the reason they do it. Um, they are absolutely fantastic diesels. They're quiet, they're, they're brilliant electronic injection diesels. However, if you want to convert those to run on veggie oil, you need to actually have a veggie oil computer to run all of that sort of stuff because the computers start to think, hang on, this fuel isn't diesel, I, I need to start shutting things down. So you need to have a, a system that actually talks to the original computer to stop that. But you can buy those systems. Yeah, you can buy that. So, that, so we work with a company in Germany called um, Biotech, and they make those computers for trucks, and they're about 12,000 sorry, 9,000 euro at the time we were looking at them. So they're, they're not cheap. But if you're using, you know, a couple of hundred thousand liters of diesel a year, it's worth it, it pays it back, but it's just not worth it if you're, you know, only using a 1,000 or 1,500 liters of diesel a year, it, you won't get any payback for it. Now, the other side of that is mechanical injection diesels are very simple and they're the cheapest to modify and the cheapest to um, to run on veggie oil. That's what Brewpig has. Brewpig has a Cummins 855, which is mechanically injected. The only things you have to do to, to um, modify a mechanically injected diesel to run on veggie oil is you need to firstly process the oil um, so that it's there's, there's no water and it's down to at least sort of one or two microns. So you have to go down that far. Pretty much. Some people say some people say um, five. Yeah, that's what I've read. I don't I don't trust that. I'd rather go lower. I mean, if you can, um, why not? Yes, I mean, there's no difference in filters. You may as well put a one micron filter in and then a five micron. So you know, so. Um, so you need to process your fuel, fuel oil so that it's good enough and clean enough. Um, and then you need to, and that's, we'll show you how to do that through the series. Um, and then you need to heat the oil to above uh, 76 degrees Celsius, because once it's at that stage, it has the same viscosity or same runniness as diesel. Um, and then it'll just go through the motor just 
as completely as if you were running on diesel. There's there's next to no difference. Except you got starting up and yeah turning off. Yeah, so you can't start a diesel on veggie oil um, because it's too thick. It's it's if it's cold veggie oil, it's too thick. So you start. You have two tanks. You have a diesel tank and an oil tank. You start up on diesel, get the motor up to operating temperature, and so on. And then your heat exchangers and so on for the oil are, are making that oil hot enough to be able to run in the engine. So you flip the valves over and you can start running on veggie oil. And then 10 minutes before you shut down, flick it back over to diesel. And that basically purges all your injector lines of veggie oil and fills them back with diesel only. And then you're good to start in the morning sort of thing. So it's it's a simplistic way of looking at it, but um, it, it's not actually a hard conversion. Um, and, and we hope to sort of show you all of this so that we can dispel some of the myths around it as well. And we'll be, you know, tracking the whole the whole experience, getting it up and running, and then what happens to the motor over time, mm. which I think will be amazing, actually, really interesting. So, the question about solar on there, Daniel, is probably the next question. Yeah, so I'll just answer this one from John Hotch. So, what's your estimated distance you'll be able to travel on a full load of fuel? Mm -hmm. So, 8,500 8, nautical miles. So, um, to put that in context, we could start up in Australia and if there was no ice anywhere, we could start up in Australia and drive to the North Pole without refueling. And then we'd obviously need a tanker sitting at the North Pole to refuel us. <laughs> and then we'd be able to drive all the way back down to Australia again. Um, so it gives you some context. So the reason we're making the range as, as big as that is because um, brew peg will be heated by oil when we're, you know, when the motor's not running and so on, we'll have diesel burners and so on to heat the interior of the boat um, or, or oil burners or whatever it may be. Or to maybe cook with too. Yeah, or cook with as well. So if we get frozen in, if we're going through the Northwest Passage for argument's sake, and we get frozen in and we have to spend 12 months completely locked in ice and it's minus 50, we need to have heating on that boat. Do you think that's a scary thing? Yeah, so we, we absolutely have to have heating. So we have really good insulation. Go <laughs> we have, we'll have really good insulation, but we'll also have almost a year's worth of fuel to just keep us ticking over. And then in nine months time, when the ice lets us go, we'll be able to take off again and have enough fuel to get out. <coughs> So that's, we, are, we are focused on making sure that brew bed can handle that sort of experience. Yeah, yeah. We, um, we, we want to do these these trips that go to these sort of pretty extreme places, but we don't want to do it where it's a risk that we, you know, like if there's a 50-50 chance that we'll die, there's no chance we're going to do it. Like we want to actually go there and, and see some amazing stuff and then go somewhere else, you know? So um, Yeah, it's true. Everything you thought about has got redundancies too. Mm, yeah. Like mm. one or two redundancies to the main system mm, yeah. just for that that exact reason yeah some of them have four <laughs> yeah um not that not that you're yeah, yeah. or anything <laughs> yeah yeah um james to her will you have a solar setup we will um we'll have and right now we've got two kilowatts of solar and we're probably going to bump that up to but four? probably to four yeah um but in the polar regions solar is almost useless because the sun's at too low an angle um, so in the polar regions, we'll have we're going to have wind turbines as well. So they'll be doing the bulk of the renewable generation in the polar regions, and then we'll the also generators. have a, a generator because mm. we know that we're not going to get enough power from the wind alone. John Hodge, congrats on getting Brewpig in Passage Maker magazine. Yeah, that was yeah, cool. Thanks. That was all, that was all on just just wrote that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, awesome thanks. job. Um, Frantic, how is the dump and run schedule looking? Uh, it's actually quite cool. Do you want to talk about the recent change that you get in the water a bit faster? Yeah, well, yeah, we, we're just really keen to try and, and make uh, not this season in touch but the following, if we can, and it may stretch out to the following year, but we, we really want to get on with it, um, and we can see that it's possible. Dan's almost starting on the, um, what are they called? The, the... Flappy wing stabilizers. <laughs> What's the real name? Angry bird stabilizers. <laughs> Sorry. Everything's got a name. Yeah, sorry. So we, we so I'll come back into the real world. We have to we have to build stabilizers on the boat to, to stop the boat from sort of doing this as we're side on to waves and things like that. They're one of the bigger engineering projects on yeah. the boat and, and we're actually almost starting it. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I remember six months ago we were thinking it was a year and a half away, but we're yeah. actually we're moving so we're probably, fast. Now. Probably two weeks away from starting them. Like we're pretty yeah, close. Yeah, yeah, about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um so that'll be so an ba amazing. Basically project. they're they're basically on e on either side of Brewpeg. From the the chine or the where the hull does it sort of curve in if you don't know boats that well um we're going to be basically putting a hinge there so it's underwater and these will have big wings that are 12 feet long and about two feet wide and they fold right down and sort of sit at a 45 degree angle as the boat's going along on either side of the boat it'll sit at a 45 degree angle um and, like wings yeah like a wing 
Or like I suppose like a flipper. More like a flipper. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's a flipper. good idea. If yeah, you think of like good. a, if you think of like a, um, I don't know, like a whale. You know how they have the the flippers at the front. Basically, brew people have the same version, like like a, so, like a kind of that sort of system where you have like a stabilizer at each side. And what it does is it just it stops the boat from well, it doesn't stop, but it significantly reduces that rolling motion. And what, what's the diameter, like the measurements? So twelve feet long by two feet wide. Yeah. So so, so quite quite thin really, but that's all you need, and they'll be built really strong. Yeah. Um, Dame was just talking to um one of the local uh, guys Boiler here. Maker, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, they were just working out the engineering um, for that, so they're going to over engineer it, of course. So Dame tends to over engineer everything, so it's strong. Yeah. But yeah, so so. I suppose the point is, is we're hoping to make um, not the end of this year, but the following year season for Antarctica, which means we need to move faster. Yeah. So um, we're looking at just doing a bit more in the water than we thought, but we're also starting to move faster with the, the work, which is really great with all the help we're getting. So yeah, so I'm keen on getting in the water. Phil or Kill, this is one for you, right? Um, as far as I know, someone, well, one of you is taking quite a round trip to be at hand. How are you coping with work, travel and creating content, right? Yeah, I'm traveling. Oh. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's not too bad. Um, uh, I don't know where that person's located, but like living in Queensland, you could get used to traveling around pretty much mm. as if it's such a, a big state and everything's so spread apart that traveling is just part of life, really. Mm. Um, yeah, work, work life balance is good. Um, editing takes some time, but it's fun, it's enjoyable. Hope you guys enjoy the videos. Yeah. To put that comment in context, yeah, you're so humble. Editing takes yeah. time. Like it's a second job. It's uh, like unbelievably it, yeah. demanding. To do an episode, he he edits for probably twenty to thirty hours a week. So and you're, and you're doing giving you're content. Doing, yeah. You're doing all the recording. Jess, Jess has got a little editing desk set up. So yeah. yeah. So yeah. I do I do as recording as I can and, and a lot of freehand. You know, sort of rather than on a tripod, I'm I'm getting sort of angles and things and. Yeah. Um, and catching up with Dame as he does each bit. Actually, I, I just, I thought it's about it, I was thinking about it yesterday, I painted the radar mask. It took me about 10 minutes to paint the radar mask, but it took me an hour and a half to do it because I was dicking around with cameras almost the whole time trying <laughs> to get it to work. Um, can you not mix half diesel with half veg? So this is Sterling Sabre 28. Can you not mix half diesel with half veg oil to thin it when it's extremely cold? Would that not work? I've heard an article about that recently. I used to put shop bought veg oil into half a tank of fuel and it ran fine. So yes, you can. So it is common for people with not engines that are completely unmodified to put 20% veg oil in and they run fine. Yeah, obviously filter your veg oil down and all that sort of stuff, but they, they run fine. Um, there are systems out there that are called single tank systems where people start up on cold veg oil and they some of them you can mix in um, proportions of petrol as well to help with cold start and things like that. So there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, the only reason we're going with what we have, our system is the two tank system is because it's a real basic, sturdy system and there's a lot of knowledge around it. So um, I, because because we have to be super, super reliable, I'd rather try something that there's, you know, there's been a thousand people do it before me sort of thing, just to be certain that I'm going to have a massively reliable system. It is, I mean, you couldn't change it as you go along. If you want yeah, to try new things, absolutely, hey. yeah, yeah. So oh, Jackson Sable, are they, are those like hinged dagger boards? Almost exactly like hinged dagger boards, yeah. So, um, it's a long, thin, aerodynamic foil um, that, yeah, basically hinges at the chine and goes down on a 45 degree angle. But usually they're a flat panel. Yeah, so normally when a trawler builds these things, so there's quite a few of these running around in the southern end of Australia, so they use them quite a lot in a place called Bass Strait, um, this type of stabiliser. That they're, they're renowned as being one of the, the most um, efficient stabilisers and also the most effective. Um, normally they just use a piece of 25 mil steel and cut it out 8 feet by 3 feet and slap it on the side of the boat. Um, I have a racing yacht racing background, and the thought of having a, um, a flat piece of steel slapped on the side of my boat just absolutely does my head in. So um, I can't do that. So I'm going to build nice aerodynamic foil shapes so that we actually have a really efficient foil. But it is cheaper to do it the way you're thinking, isn't it? it yeah, it actually is cheaper to do it the way I'm doing because it. Because the, the, the thickness of the steel, getting the panel, getting the actual metal, is it's expensive. It would probably it would probably cost maybe two grand. Two and a half grand just to buy the steel if i was to build it out of solid 25 mil plate and and the stainless needed and welded on and so on the way i'm doing it i reckon i'll get changed out of 500 bucks mm. and i'll have a, a lighter more a lighter stronger more effective system when i'm finished does it move with the the shape 
like that's rather than flat, it's aerodynamic, but it moves, it moves through the water easier, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. But even when they're flat, they reckon they're the most efficient system that there is yeah. on, you know, for external stabilizers. Yeah. Who actually owns the boat? Is it a partnership? Uh, no, it's pretty simple. Me and Jess own it. Um, we we bought it uh, four years ago, August two thousand and fourteen. Um, as oh, just years. yeah, as a stripped out steel shell. Um, so we paid scrap value for the hull, and um, we've pretty much just built it up since then. Um, so it's it's just been one of those things that you, as cash flow allows, we just keep putting more and more parts on the boat and so on, and, and now we have what we have. Yeah, but the idea is people being on this journey with us, building it with us, traveling with us, being a part of it. So in our in our minds, it was never just us. It's, it was and part of the reason for getting such a big boat is, yeah. you know, it sleeps a lot of people and a lot of people can, yeah. can have these adventures too. So yeah. we, we don't want to be a channel where we ask for Patreons and then we sail off into the sunset and you're paying for our holiday. Um, yeah. Yeah, forget, forget what you know about sailing channels yeah. Yeah, yeah. when it yeah, comes yeah. to group yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're the complete opposite. We want to build the boat and we're building it with our money and then we, and then we want to take people with us. So it's, um, yeah. Cause, cause that's the life we want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we what like, else would you do with your time? Yeah. 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 Um, Gary Barris, I would automate the changeover between diesel and oil. It would only take two timers, solenoid valves and some wiring. Yeah, mm. so there's a system out there called Plant Drive, which does exactly that. Um, is a uh, Ed, Ed Beggs is the guy's name, Edward Beggs in Canada. He's a super nice dude. Um, I spoke to him a while back about it. And we, we went all through the, the details of his system and that, and it's it's about, I think it's like 500 or 700 US. So it's really cheap um, for what it is. It's a fully automated system and it pretty much is a bolt-in um, system to allow visual conversions on diesel. So if you're thinking about it, like check out plantdrive.ca or whatever the Canada one is, just Google plant drive, you'll find it. Um, but yes, that's exactly what it does is it basically automates that changeover. I see their opinions. I'd pay to not watch Kardashians. <laughs> um, John Hodge, how do we get a ticket for the trip? So um, get in touch with us. That's the main thing. Get in touch with us. We're not we're not selling tickets for the trip yet because we haven't got the boat in the water. But as soon as the boat's in the water, we're going to start basically um, making sure that we can legally get people on board and, and all that sort of stuff. Well, we're starting that process now of finding out the yeah. legal. But it looks it looks really good. It looks fine. Um, and what we whatever we have to do to make that possible, we'll do. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but. Yeah. It, it's. Uh, we want to make sure that the sea trials are done and when we're absolutely certain that we're going to yeah. have you on board, we're going to take you on a trip, we'll, we'll let everyone know. But what we want people to do is let us know that you're interested so that you're on the list at the top of the list. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's first in, first served, really. Brad Harris, do you need to protect the external cooling pipes from ice? Good question. Do you yes. want to answer what? Yeah, okay. yeah. We're, we're sliding them off and probably into them. Probably down uh, in the lower part of New Zealand when we get across. So we're not doing it in uh, Australia because we don't need to worry about it. But when we're starting to get towards moving uh, on the trip down to Antarctica, we're going to cut them off and it's going to be an internal system because <coughs> it, they'll get damaged easily. Yes, we see that you can support Brewpig and have a reminder to inspire you by purchasing a $20 challenge coin. $15 goes to Brewpig, support the content you enjoy yep. and content that makes the world a better place. Yes, I'm going to go and get the coin. I've got one right here. Oh, you got one. Oh, oh, cool. nice. I always, Doug, it's on me at all times. So. <laughs> we actually want to do a, a shout out to Doug. Um, yeah. He asked us if we'd like to go in on this uh, coin challenge. I think there's nine coins and it's boat, boat building channels. Um, people are doing this sort of project and it's to support people. But you actually get a coin in, I think it's nine boats, um, have designed their own coin and, you know, their, their sort of key, key words or key sort of phrases on there as well. And on the bag, um, it's quite busy on the bag, but it's got a few things there that sort of represent us. So, so I'll show you. That's, um, I'll be a little bit By the way, this is not a hard sell. This no, it's not a hard sell. Yeah, sure. I just really like this coin. So, um, so there's an iceberg to represent where we're going to be going. Um, there's a, an albatross. So this is a. Um, uh, so where Jess is from in Dunedin, um, there's an albatross colony, and these are massive birds. They got like a, a ten foot wingspan. Or and eight they foot. travel across oceans. Yeah. They, um, they, they, they travel for years. These, these guys will travel sort of 10,000 miles a year just cruising along. They'll spend nine to 10 months a year at sea and then they'll come back in to breed and go straight back out to sea again. So they're amazing birds. Um, there's an olive branch there to re represent the fuel. There is um, the Southern Cross to represent building a boat in Australia. And then on the Albatross, there's heaps of Maori designs, which is um, me and Jess are both Kiwis. So we're really pleased and proud of our, um, our culture. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so thank, thanks Doug for in, involving yeah. us with this, and, and it's it's a way to, to get funds and, and get kind of the community yeah. working. But it's also um, 
we received a, a, a small bunch of them because we want to give them to, to different um, volunteers who want to um, that are supporting us, and uh, it was amazing. They're heavy, they're chunky, and mm. and it's just this constant reminder. And I really love it. Yeah. So thank, thanks for yeah. creating that, Dave. It's amazing awesome. the support you're offering all us, mm. all us guys. So yeah, if you want to get one, just get, um, how do they? So go. If, if you're interested in getting one of ours or one of Seekers or any of the other boat building channels, um, go to uh, svseeker.com and then click on their junk store and you can scroll down and see the challenge coins. There's, there's lots available. It's not just ours. There's like mm. there's heaps available um, and you can see um, like salt and tar and um, frantic through, sailing adventures. Can you go through us to get the Seeker? Or, have we got like... We don't have one set up. No, no we, we don't. We, we, we can do up. that. We'll, yeah, we'll set one up on this weekend. Yeah, we haven't got yeah. it set up at the moment. So if you're keen yeah. on getting one, go to seeker dot or svseeker.com and, and check out the challenge coins. But if you want to, we'll set one up um, in the next day or so. Yeah, we'll, we will we'll, definitely. Yeah, we'll get, we'll we'll get it done. But done, yeah. it'll yeah. be on brewpig.com and then you'll be able to check out challenge coins yeah. that way. Yeah. So Neptune's creation. Hello from Bridge City, Texas. Love what you're doing. Do you plan to reinforce the bow? Um, yes mm. and no. So we're definitely going to be putting plating on the outside, additional plating on the outside. So apparently we'll be, we don't we don't need to. Apparently we're yeah. strong enough, but we just think no, just that extra. We've been security. told that we, yeah we've been told that we're strong enough by a guy that builds ice boats. Um, that said, uh, I want to be able to if I'm getting frozen in and I'm getting stuck, I want to be able to ram that ice so that I can get out without risking the boat. So. We, we will be putting additional plating on the front of the boat. Um, how thick exactly, we're not 100% sure yet. We have to do the calculations. Um, and we we may put uh, a, a second rib in between each of the existing ribs. We'll put it, add an additional rib in there. So at the moment, the ribs are 450 mil apart, and then we'll throw one straight down the centre and, and brace it for the front half of the boat, pretty much. Um, it just depends. We're gonna, we'll obviously need to do the calculations to figure out what we need, but at a minimum, we're going to be reinforcing it with additional plating on the outside. John Hodge, please let us know as soon as you are able to have guests aboard with the wife and I want to see, want to tea do to Australia. From Florida. From Florida and we'd love to spend some time on Brewpeak Float to the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah, 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 we will. We'll let you know. Yeah. It's going to be the first trip, isn't it? Yeah, gonna, we need to, um, yeah. Mention that. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. That's, that's going to be the first trip and, and it'll, we're not sure how long we'll be up in the, the reef, but it's a massive area and it's so incredible. Um, so we'll, we'll put your names down, yeah? Cool, thanks. <laughs> um, is there any plans to go to the Caribbean? Um, yeah, so we're not limited to the ice. So just to be really clear, Brewpig is capable of doing that sort of stuff when we're finished, but we're definitely not limiting ourselves to just those types of places. So um, obviously in the winter, we can't go through Northwest or you know Antarctica or anything like that. Um, so in those sort of times, we're going to be going um, into like South Pacific and yeah, um, up into the Caribbean and sort of all around in the, the hotter areas, um, because obviously in the, around the equator, um, you're generally best to do that in the winter um, because you, you don't risk the, the cyclones and the hurricanes and things like that as much. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. We will be planning to go into the Caribbean and into the South Pacific and around those sort of areas, um, but it'll be on the off season from the ice work, if that makes sense. Um, Jackson say, well, I actually may have kind of a serious question for once. Really? Whoa. Um, We're not going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if you've mentioned already, but are you planning on having internet access on the water? And if so, how will you accomplish that in some of the remote areas? Okay, so that's a cool question. So um, so there's different layers of internet that we'll have. So um, there'll be times, so when we're close enough to land and we can get um, a 3 or 4G cell phone reception, which is pretty much up to about maybe 20 kilometers offshore. So it's, I don't know, what's that, about 10 miles here yeah. yeah. in Australia. Um, so yeah, if we're within basically coastal site, um, we'll have uh, cell phone internet um, and we've got some some big aerials and some powerful modems and stuff to do that um, and that's the cheapest and most reliable type of internet for us to use if we're further offshore than that you can go to satellite internet um, but it gets patchy and it's really expensive like to do for example to do a live feed like this over satellite internet you're probably talking maybe three hundred dollars worth of data um, so it gets really, really expensive to do that sort of stuff. And, and it's also had a lot of latency, so there'd be a lot of lag and a lot of buffering. Um, I have come across actually a channel, I can't remember the name of the channel now, but I, I came across a channel the other day that was using um, SSB to relay a signal back to a station in Oregon. And then basically, I, I'm assuming like cable internet or something from there, but he was, he was in the middle of the Pacific live streaming mm -hmm. on um, at 720p, so, so almost um, really good quality HD, um, yeah, via SSB, which is, is essentially a 
there's virtually no cost to do that and he's able to do it so i'd love to know about that because that's amazing if you can do it via ssb that would be outstanding um but for now the plan is basically um cell phone 3 and 4g internet and satellite internet um as our as our backup that's the, the best i could come up with <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys awesome thanks, thanks, thanks peter. Peter. Thanks, guys. Awesome to have you guys along. Thanks, guys. Um, and uh, yeah, with this this live stream will be live stream will be edited up and uh, released on Tuesday. So um, look forward to you guys uh, seeing you then. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. And and I'll reiterate the offer we made in our um, how do we fund Rupee video mm -hmm. um, episode thirty four. So um, uh, if you're thinking about doing an Australian holiday or you know you, you want to get down this part of the world and you um, are happy to donate a bit of time to Rupee. Come and see us for a bit, and we'll put you up. We'll feed you, and we'll, you know, we'll house you. And everything. I'll, you, I'll take you fishing. Yeah, you've got a car you can use. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll put you up, and kind of, you know, treat you as part of the Brewpeg family, and so on. And then you can, you know, do a bit of work on the boat, and, and sort of get to know us, and and then jet off into Australia and check out a bit more of uh, this part of the world or New Zealand. And um, so yeah, we're really happy to have people come on the boat and and sort of start the adventure now. Um, so if you are thinking of that, get in touch with us. You can either get on uh, hold of us through our website, brewpeg.com, or you can get on to us via our Facebook uh, channel, um, and uh, our Facebook page, sorry, and um, yeah, we can we can help arrange that for you as well. I'll be here, hanging on, waiting for your call. Seems like time, as a wave passing by, leave a mark in our minds. Turn the memories River's gonna cry when you're Gone, 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 gone River's gonna cry when you're Gone, gone, 